This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Next is impairment in group accounts. If you remember impairment from financial reporting, uh, you'll find this not too bad. If you've completely forgotten its existence, you may find it easier to listen to this after you've worked through impairment, which is later in our notes when it talks about regular impairment of assets. Um, but see how you go. There are a lot of concepts here and it'll be something you'll need to look back at a couple of times. So try not to get too angry with it at first. Now, all sorts of jargon initially. When you have goodwill, you have to do an annual impairment review. That's the starting point. So there will be an impairment if the carrying amount of the subsidiary is greater than its recoverable amount. And straight away, you see this strange word, CGU, CGU, you can see the full words a bit further down, cash generator unit. Each subsidiary is normally seen to be a cash generating unit. It must be because that's what subsidiaries are for, hopefully to generate cash. And what we have to do is every year end, compare the total carrying amount of that subsidiary with its recoverable amount. The total carrying amount will be all of the carrying amount of its assets and liabilities plus the carrying amount of the goodwill. You'll see this in example five in just a minute. So we need to take the carrying value of that subsidiary as a unit. What is recoverable amount? It's the money you would generate. Now, when we talk about the money that you would generate, there are two ways that you could generate money from an asset or group of assets. Here's my asset, my calculator. I could generate money by selling it if, I, if it was known, perhaps the government says calculation is now banned. Be a bit odd, wouldn't it? I could sell it, in which case I generate fair value, less cost to sell. Or I could walk up and down the high street saying, do you want me to add something up for you, madam, to random shoppers? In which case, again, I would look at the value in use. The value in use is the value if you continue to use it. Fair value, less cost to sell is actually what happens if you sell it now. If you're given both figures, you need the greater. So as it says here, it's the higher. And we'll talk more about this under impairment. What do I do? Do I continue to use or do I sell it now? Continuing to use is a, is a calculation involving future cash flows and lots of discounting. We'll see it later in the syllabus. So therefore, we may well have impairments. The impairment is of the whole cash generating unit, the whole subsidiary. And one of the things that you may remember from FR, if not, I'll remind you now, is that having worked out what the impairment is, you then have to start writing down the assets. And the first asset which gets written down, it's standing there like a wibbly wobbly jelly is goodwill. So bang, you write down the goodwill. If you write it down to nothing, you then have to start on the other assets. But we'll worry about that in a minute. The calculation is different depending on the type of goodwill that you've got. So we're gonna start with the one that's certainly easier, and that is what happens if you're dealing with a subsidiary where you've calculated full or fair value goodwill. Pause the recording, 
and read example five, please. It's in three paragraphs. So if you look at the first paragraph, it's telling us what happened on the 1st of January 15. They bought the subsidiary. The second paragraph is telling us what happened in the next month. I'm so sorry, in the next year. So there were some profits. And then they have to do an impairment review on the 31st of December 15 on the year end. So it's like two time periods. Time naught is at the start. Time one is when you have to do the impairment calculation. The question, as it says, is to calculate the impairment. So we'll have a look at this now. Bear in mind, this is an example using full goodwill. Everything is about performer. When you do an impairment calculation, you're comparing the carrying amount with the recoverable amount. The subsidiary is seen to be a unit on its own, a cash generating unit. So I'm doing this impairment on the 31st of December. So I need to know the carrying amount of the subsidiary on that day. That will comprise its goodwill and its net assets. So that's the first thing I need to do. That will give me the carrying amount of the subsidiary. We're not told what the goodwill is, so we'll have to work it out. So let me just put a working reference or try to. There we go. Just leave a little bit of a gap there working. And we'll sort out a little working for goodwill. Everything in the performers, isn't it? Cost plus NCI less the fair value of the net assets. All measured at the date of acquisition. That would have been on the 1st of Jan. So let's try and hoover up those numbers. I'm going to highlight them in blue. The cost was 20. The NCI was 15. And the net assets were 25. The cost was 20. The NCI was 15. And the net assets were 25. Here we go. 20, 15, 25. Goodwill is 10. And that's the position at the start of the year. So the goodwill would be in the accounts at 10. So let me put that back into my answer. Don't forget, if you're scribbling, you can keep pausing the recording. So the carrying amount of the goodwill is 10. Now the net assets. Now be careful. We're told two numbers that are relevant to the net assets. Highlighting them in green. First of all, we know the net assets at the start of the year. And secondly, we know the, the increase in net assets of five during the year. Remember, one of the things you first learned at school when the other kids were drawing or painting and you stuck up your hand and said, no, miss, I want to be an accountant. One of the first things your teacher said to you was, my child, the accounting equation. Opening the assets plus profit equals closing the assets. Now, although that's very basic, if you got that wrong, they would take it very seriously. It's a very important basic point. So 25 plus five 
would therefore give me net assets at the balance sheet date of 35. So the carrying amount, 25, no, that's 30, isn't it? 30. 25 plus 5 is 30. Deliberate mistake just to see if you'd spot it. Now we need to, to compare to recoverable amount. And this is the greater of value in use and fair value, less cost to sell. Sometimes people say fair value, less cost of disposal. It's really just NRV, isn't it? So let's look back at the scenario and see if we can find. So highlighting now in yellow, the value in use is 38. The fair value less cost to sell is 36. 38 and 36. Decision time, which is greater, 38. That therefore means that the impairment to be recognised in the accounts is two, and that will go to profit and loss. This is full goodwill, isn't it? So if you were trying to summarise the effect on the accounts, you'll see that in our course notes, they refer there to the fact that with full goodwill, actually, some part of that impairment should be charged against the NCI because it's full goodwill. So in my group structure, this was a 60% subsidiary. So just showing you the journal underneath or the adjustment, I would be crediting the goodwill with two. I'll be debiting, if I was doing say a balance sheet, retained earnings with 60% and debiting NCI with 40%. So that would give you 1.2 and 0.8. Don't forget in this exam, if you don't know your debits and credits, well, I think you should, to be honest, but if you don't, it's not the end of the world. If they ask you for the adjustment, you get the mark by just saying what goes up or down. So if you just wrote the word, retained earnings go down, NCI goes down, and goodwill, of course, goes down, it's absolutely fine. There we are. That is full goodwill impairment. And if you get asked that, I would expect you to get it right. but we haven't finished yet. So let's go back to the notes. And this is the one where if you've got a friend with you, then you might almost want to hold their hands. Impairment, if you are dealing with proportionate or partial goodwill. And it starts off very innocently. It says that if you're using proportionate goodwill, the impairment, is all allocated against the group, so there's no impact on the NCI. And we're kind of going, yep, I can live with that. That looks absolutely fine and tickety-boo to me. The issue, though, and where this gets more complex, is to how you do the calculation. And the logic is just about this. It's something that I think no one ever thought about before about I think the first time I saw it was about 2005. It had never occurred to me before that there was a problem. So I'm just scribbling now, so I wouldn't worry about jotting down my scribbles. Is that when you do an impairment calculation, you've got the goodwill and the net assets and the recoverable amount. Now, the recoverable amount is the recoverable amount on 100%, so the recoverable amount is 
100%, this is what the subsidiary as a whole could be sold for. The net assets, 100%. But if you're using proportionate goodwill, you'll only work out the goodwill on my share, which might be 70%. And for many years of teaching, I just thought, whatever. And then someone very clever, I think it was in America, with a brain the size of 58 watermelons, woke up and said, aha, we're not matching like with like. So what you have to do is you say, we're not matching like with like. So we go through a process of grossing up the goodwill temporarily. And that's what we're going to see. It's a very, very, very odd calculation. So the explanation in the notes is fine. As it says here, the issue is that the goodwill only reflects partial goodwill. So you have to gross it up to an equivalent full goodwill amount then you can compare that value to the recoverable amount. But as it says, I'm highlighting this in blue, this grossing up is only for the purpose of the calculation of the impairment. Now we used to say, this is something that you would do on the back of a cigarette packet, because that's what we used to do. Because in those days, everyone used to smoke. So you'd use your cigarette packet to work this out, or the back of the cigarette packet. Well, actually, it's not part of the double entry. So you gross it up, and later you have to reverse it, and that's where it can get messy. As it says in the note, the grossing up is not recorded in the ledger. It's something you do on a bit of scrap paper. I suppose these days, a bit of scrap spreadsheet. So we're going to take a look at this and there's an illustration. I'll work the illustration probably using the same numbers but we may end up with slightly different performer. So initially let's just focus on the bit of the question just above that black line. So just have to pause the tape and have a look at the bit above the black line and then I'll start to talk. Good. It's an 80% subsidiary. They bought it at the start of the year for 60. The net assets were 40. They're using partial goodwill. So let's just check the calculation that they've done it correctly. Consideration 60. Net assets 40. NCI proportion of net assets. 20% to 40. 8. So goodwill 28. That's fine. That's what happened at the start. So all of this is at the start of the year. Here we are now at the end of the year. At the end of the year, we can see like the last question, they made profits for the year of 10 and we're told the recoverable amount is 45. The numbers that we've got that are relevant are the goodwill, the fact it's an 80% group, the net assets at the start of the year, 40, the profit in the year, which was 10, and recoverable amount, 45. What a lot of numbers. But we'll, we'll set out and we'll set out an impairment calculation for that illustration. So this is an example using partial or proportionate goodwill. This review is being done 
on the 31st of December, 18. I have to compare the carrying amount with the recover amount. Everything's about the performer. So the carrying amount, we're concerned with goodwill. And we're also concerned with my net assets. This is at the end of the year. The goodwill at the start of the year was 28. But this is where we have to gross it up. You gross it up. And with, this is an 80% subsidiary. So you gross it up by multiplying by 100 over 80. It's not in the ledgers. It's artificially grossing it up. So we pretend and we say that theoretically the full goodwill would have been 35. It's silly really, isn't it? Because... Um, you know, the goodwill that attaches to the minority would actually be very small because they don't have any voting rights. But that's the way we have to do it. Net assets, we want the figure at the start of the year, which was 40, and the profit for the year, which was 10. So that's just like the last example, isn't it? 40 plus 10, that's 50. The recoverable amount is given in the question. So at the moment, if I did a subtotal, I've got 85. Where's it gone? There we are, it's back. So I've got a subtotal, which is 85. There we are. Recoverable amount in this scenario was 45. That's an impairment, therefore, of 40. Now, there are, this is a kind of multiple problem. This one's a real pain. And I think it will be clearer when you've revised impairment properly. So actually, that impairment you can see it exceeds both values we've got for goodwill. So not only will they have to write down the um, not only will they have to write down the goodwill, they're also going to have to write down the other net assets. So when I look at that impairment and think about how I'm going to allocate it, allocated to. There are different ways to express this, but you should end up with the same answer. So they say, goodwill, and then anything else is allocated against the other fixed or non-current assets. But I'll put other net assets for now. So if I stay with grossing up for now, that was 35. 35 for the goodwill. Five for the other net assets. That's the 40. But in fact, the goodwill wasn't actually 35 in the accounts, was it, at all? It was only 28. So in a sense, you're kind of reversing the grossing up right at the end of the question. So as a result of this, what would we see if we did a revised soft P or consolidated soft P? The goodwill itself is going to end back at zero. We'll try and justify that in a minute. The other net assets, so don't worry, I'll be back to that in a minute, but let's just sort out the easy bit, are reducing... The other net assets are reducing from 50 
and they're going to reduce by 5. So that's 50 minus 5, which is 45. So that would be a revised balance sheet. You can see it agrees the recoverable amount. And the loss, as I say, is always initially against the goodwill. So in terms of getting it right, I think one way you could do um, is to, but I wouldn't get too excited here, is I would type this, the goodwill was 35, it is to be impaired by 35, it is nothing, but I tend to say, look, it's 80% of nothing, which is of course nothing, and that is sort of reducing that grossing up. So you might like that, but you might not. The important thing is you follow me as far as the allocation. If you're saying, what is the journal? Well, profits have fallen. The goodwill has fallen. And actually, in this example, the other net assets have fallen as well. Now, how much did the goodwill actually fall by? Well, what was it at the start of the question? It was 28. So you can't actually reduce it by more than 28. I do know. Let's just check that. You might be saying you're lying. I'm not lying. That was 28. So I can only take 28 off the goodwill. The other five would come off of other assets like PPE. So what does feel counterintuitive, believe me, is that you've reduced again. It looks like you had this impairment of 40. In fact, the actual charge to P&L is only 33. Where's the seven? Has it disappeared? Was it a magic trick? No, it's because we artificially grossed goodwill up by seven in the first place. As a tutor, I think it probably, but maybe I'm just slow. It probably took me about two years before I used to get that consistently right. So I'm not saying get it wrong. I'm just saying don't spend the whole year or the whole period of study worrying terribly about that. Um, the key thing is in the first place, remember, if it says partial goodwill, you're supposed to gross it up. I think that example is quite harsh because um, it's not just goodwill, it's other net assets that are affected because the impairment is so significant. But look back at that after you've actually studied impairment and it'll probably start to click a little bit better. Finally, we have got a little example in the notes on associate impairment. So it's perhaps worth looking at that. So nothing, it's exactly the same logic. So pause only, we don't have stuff like goodwill to worry about. Pause the recording and read example six, please. So, much less information given. If you look above the black line, you've got some information about what happened at the start of the year. The cost of the investment was five. We're told it's significant influence, so it's an associate. We're told it's 25%. We're also told above the black line, aren't we? The profits in the year were 2 million. You know associates are equity accounting. So cost plus share of post acquisition profits. At the end of the year, it says the associates, the associates fair value less cost to sell is that figure. Value in use is that figure. So we'll have a look at that in just a moment. So 
Let's now set up example six and have a go at the impairment with the associate. Remember, it's always the same. It's always about comparing, isn't it? The carrying amount with the recoverable amount. So I'll abbreviate those to CA and RA. Would you do that in the exam? No, 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 you'd write them properly, but I know you'd do that. So it's all about carrying amount and recoverable amount. The carrying amount is under equity accounting. This is at the end of the year. The end of the year is the 31st of December, 15. So I've got the cost plus the share of post acquisition profits. As always, perform the working first, then sort it out. Let's have a look. The cost of the associate was five. Post act profits were two million. It's a whole year, but we only want our share. So the cost is five million. Share of post act profits is 25% of two. That's 0.5. So the carrying amount is 5.5. Recoverable amount, remember, is the greater of value in use and fair value less cost to sell. Now be careful, are they giving you the value in use of the hot associate or of our share? Well, it doesn't say our share, so my assumption is that these green numbers are of the whole associate. Otherwise, we'll get a crazy result. So it's 25% of the value in use and 25% of the fair value, less cost to sell. The value in use would be, let me get this the right way round, 25% of 20, The other one, 25% of 16. So 25% of 20 would give me five. The other one would be four. Decision time, which is greater. Well, the greater is five, isn't it? So the impairment, therefore, Finally, is 0.5. On the associate, in terms of the adjustment, nothing to stress about. So if I was setting out the journal or the adjustment, what of course is happening is your share of the profit of the associate are coming down. So your retained earnings are coming down. And the value, of course, of your investment in the associate is coming down in the soft P by 0.5. Quite a lot there. But remember, impairment is something that we return to later in the syllabus. So when you, you're working through non-current assets, you'll get more confident with these terms, value in use and fair value less cost to sell. If you're not enthusiastic about the partial goodwill, you know, the bit I think you need to appreciate is you need to be able to say you gross it up. If you get as far as sorting out the 40, you're well on the way and you're going to get more than half marks and that's all we want. So as always, with your studies, keep calm and carry on. Thank you.